So it seems that lately some of my more older videos from a couple years ago have been making their rounds and a lot more people have been seeing them and discovering the channel. Um, so if you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. Um, but one of those videos that have been making their rounds is my uh, ways to get clinical experience video. And since a lot more people have been seeing that video and I guess are in the midst of trying to decide or have decided and are trying to uh, start the process of applying to clinical psych PhD programs, um, I've been getting a lot more questions like, okay, you talk about clinical experience, what about research? And even though I have addressed research experience and kind of like what programs are looking for and how to get it. I've, I've kind of addressed all of that in various videos here and there, um, but I've been getting the question so often lately that I've finally decided to just give it its own dedicated video um, in hopes that it will help. So let's just jump right in. Hi, hello, my name is Jojo and welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, welcome. So I think the probably best way for me to approach this video is just to make it less of a like concrete how to um, and more of just giving a sense of what might be most helpful. Because really like when it comes to how to get research experience, to me it kind of is just cut and dry like you do research. <laughs> Like that's kind of the only way to get research experience is you have to do research. But what might be more helpful for you to know is what might be the most important things to think about and try to obtain when you're thinking about PhD programs. And so I guess just kind of starting there, the first thing you really should do is to find a research lab, preferably a research lab at an academic institution or one that works very closely with an academic institution and of course finding a research lab to join is going to be easier to do if you are currently a student either an undergrad student or a master's student but know that you don't have to be a student in order to work in a research lab if you live nearby any colleges or universities you could very much go on their jobs listings website and see if any labs are taking outside hires for research assistant positions, research coordinators or lab coordinator positions, and you can always take your chances and apply for those. And the good thing about this is that if you are an outside hire, obviously those positions are going to have to be paid. I'm not gonna guarantee that it's gonna be a lot, but they will most likely be paid. If you are currently a student at an institution working in a research lab, you might have to do that on a purely volunteer basis. Um, or if you have the opportunity to be paid as a research assistant, that could be an option for you, um, but it's not guaranteed because you are a student. The next thing you should do, and honestly, maybe you should probably do this before you officially join the lab, is talk to students in the lab, talk to the lab advisor to really kind of scope out what the projects currently happening in the lab are, what their topics are, what they're researching, um, just to make sure that those projects align with your own interests, for one, um, because it's going to really suck if you join a lab and none of the projects happening in the lab is something you're interested in doing. But also you're doing this to get a feel for kind of like the culture of the lab uh, and really trying to see if you could see yourself fitting into the lab as someone who's conducting research as well. From there, once you join the lab, you will really want to find projects to work on that one, again, align with your own interests, and two, will really serve as learning opportunities for you to gain valuable research skills. So the way I thought about this when I first joined my lab um, was to jump on like two, maybe three max um, research projects and hold a different position for each project. So I think on the first project I was on, I was a coder for qualitative data, um, which was something that I was interested in. I really wanted to do qualitative research and I knew that coming into the master's program. The second project I was on, I both helped build the survey in Qualtrics, which is the survey software that we used 
And then afterwards, I helped clean the data in SPSS, which is the statistical software that we use. Um, and I think that is kind of like the most widely used statistical software in PhD programs. I know there's also Jamovi now that they use, um, but at the time that was still kind of new to my program and no one really wanted to mess around with it yet. Um, so we were still using SPSS. And in the third research project that I jumped on, I was a more, I held a more front facing role and was a part of the actual data collection. Um, and I was conducting interviews with participants. And in all of those instances, each of those skills became really valuable for me in conducting my own research later on. So you really kind of want to make sure that you hop on a couple of different projects at least. Um, I'm not advocating for overworking yourself. Please don't do that. Take what you can manage. <laughs> but you do want to try to gain a wide range of skills from different projects. Being on other people's research projects and being able to talk about the different roles you held in PhD interviews is always really nice. But what's even nicer is if you can talk about a research project that you yourself led, because it shows that not only can you conduct research, but you can lead a research team. And so if you have the opportunity to start your own research project in the lab that you're working in, I highly recommend you do so. Another key kind of focal point for clinical psych PhD programs when they are looking at the types of research experience you have, is they also really wanna see that you are disseminating your research to other people. So what they're really hoping to see is that you have at least presented some research somewhere. It does not necessarily have to be your research, nor does it necessarily have to be, I don't think it has to be at a research conference. They just want to see that you have taken the steps of disseminating research to the greater population. So let's say you were a contributor to a research project that then later got presented at a symposium somewhere or like on a research panel somewhere. As long as you contributed to the research and you have gotten permission from the lead researcher on that project, you can put that citation on your CV, um, even though you weren't necessarily a part of the presentation itself. Little loophole for you. <laughs> the point here is that they really just wanna see that the research you're conducting or working on is being disseminated more widely. I will say though, Unfortunately, they will always prefer if you have presented at conferences. Conferences are really expensive, so I understand. Like I said, I did not attend any conferences prior to applying to PhD programs simply because I just couldn't afford it. And I'm aware that that is a very big issue for a lot of folks. So I will just add that like, unfortunately, that will always just be the preference. However, if you absolutely cannot get any presentations to put on your CV, you can also attempt to gain publications, which is also very much favored on CVs. And again, these don't necessarily have to be publications based on your own research. If the lab that you're a part of has a data bank of data from other research projects that are kind of just sitting there, you can always ask your lab advisor and whoever owns the data to go through, see what's there, see what you can find, come up with a question and use that data to answer that question. And then you can use those findings from that data to write up a paper either on your own or with a team. Um, you can also gain publications through helping other people with their papers. So you may not necessarily be a first author, but coming into PhD programs, they don't really expect you to have many first authored papers. I actually don't think they expect you to have any because it is really hard to conduct your own research and get a first authored publication as like an undergrad or a master's student. It's not impossible. It's just really hard. <laughs> so publications are also highly favored on CVs for PhD programs. And so if you're able to get one, that can definitely serve as a supplement to not having conference presentations. So that is pretty much all I have for this video. Um, I hope, I, I feel like I kind of ran through that really quickly. This video is probably going to be really short. Um, but I hope it was helpful nonetheless. <laughs> so with that being said, thank you for watching, especially if you've made it all the way to the end. I truly appreciate it. Leave me a comment down below if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos. As always, like, share, and subscribe, and click that little notification bell so you don't miss my next upload, and I'll see you in my next one.